So our uh, final speaker for this session is Varadam Charan Soan from uh, Mahidol University in Thailand. So Varadam is an associate professor of biochemistry uh, uh, and is also at the Integrative Computational Bioscience Center in Mahidol University. Uh, uh, has, some of you may know him already. He's been a speaker at past Human Cell Atlas events and really a pioneer in single cell research in Thailand. His group is interested in gene environment interactions and how that affects uh, regulation of gene expression, uh, looking at human samples, plant samples uh, in response to stress, climate change, salinity, uh, uh, salinity, I guess, for plants, not humans. So, uh, and yeah, it, it, as I mentioned, he's a single cell pioneer in Thailand and uh, also uh, one of our, uh, our, our newest member in Human Cell Atlas Asia IDA project. Well done, the floor to your talk. Okay, thanks so much, Shia, for very kind introductions. So let me um, share my slide. Okay, so um, can I just quickly check if you can see uh, the correct screen? We can okay. see your screen. All right, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, once again, thanks so much, Xiao, for very kind introductions, uh, and also um, for uh, inviting me to to give this talk. So. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, so um, so uh, as um, you can see um, from the titles, uh, this talk is going to be slightly different from my previous talk, where um, instead of seeing series of um, results from uh, single cells, so I was asked to uh, share a bit of experience of setting up uh, single cell biology research um, facilities in Thailand with uh, sort of uh, rather limited resources, and and eventually how we try to contribute um, something new to the SCA as well. So um, I just want to quickly uh, start from uh, um, mentioning people who make this happen um, right up front. So basically, um, this work um, so far has been possible um, uh, thanks to our team. So you can see that uh, my teams, um, they look uh, pretty young, and that's because um, all of them are grad students. So they're master and, and PhD students. And uh, as Chia mentioned, um, half of the groups are working on plants. So uh, we have plant peoples and the other half are uh, single cell people. Uh, so very few labs in Thailand can afford um, long-term scientists or postdocs. So uh, that's possibly explain one of the reasons why, you know, we have these limitations in driving um, uh, frontier research. So uh, with one group, it's not enough to, uh, to commit to this um, very great project. So uh, I also thank my long-term collaborators, um, Pan Pan Matangkasombat and her teams. And you can see that uh, her teams look pretty young. So um, basically uh, they're composed of mostly students as well. Um, also, I'd like to thank um, um, Sarah Tajman and her team who uh, helped us a lot with the technical um, technicalities. Um, about three years ago, when we first started um, trying to establish a single cell technique in Thailand, and that is possible um, thanks to the Newton Fund from the British government. So uh, as Deepa mentioned in the first um, talk of the sessions, so we recently joined um, IDA. And so I hopefully um, very soon we can start contributing and delivering some data. So I'd like to once again, thanks Chiam, Jay, Wu Yang, and, and everyone else for making this happen. So I'm um, getting to um, the talk itself. So I like to talk uh, mainly about two things. Um, so first, uh, hopefully I can share some experience of setting up the single cell facility in Thailand. Uh, this might not be um, applicable to uh, um, other uh, larger countries who has already has different uh, technologies um, available like Japan, um, Singapore and, and China, but it might be uh, useful for other countries any other countries in Asia who would like to set up uh, the same systems. And hopefully we can share what we have to go through and what we um, get around that. And if we have time toward the end, hopefully we can share some of the results that we have um, from our, um, our work in Thailand as well. 
So um, basically, um, about three years ago, um, we tried to start um, the facilities of, um, to uh, perform single sale in Thailand for the first time. So back then, um, very few people in Thailand were aware of um, single cell biology altogether, uh, living alone human cell at last. So it's, it's pretty uh, quite a tough time to convince people that this is um, basically the way to go. Um, so thanks to uh, the Newton Fund uh, from the British government that I mentioned before. So we were able to use that fund uh, from the from Newton funds and leverage that. And uh, so basically asked for the university, um, our university, Macedon University to, um, to basically um, uh, subsidize a, a little bit more funding and allow us to get uh, the machines, which is basically uh, central to uh, uh, single cell works. So obviously the first machine that we got uh, back uh, three years ago um, is a single cell uh, platform from 10X. Um, and the other one that we got is also, um, this is um, a, a piping robot called Zephyrus. So that would allow us to do um, um, techniques like um, SmartSeq2 or SmartSeq3, which is basically um, long range or full range of um, single cells. So I just want to share with you uh, the first time that we, we start um, doing a uh, single cell experiment in Thailand. Uh, you can see uh, the first days that we got uh, the 10X machines, which is really small. So you can see that um, we were really excited about getting um, the machines. Um, but also at the same time, we are quite intrigued by, by the size that we, this is quite small, but also uh, with the price. So I'm not sure about the price um, in any other countries in, in the world, but basically the price that we got uh, the 10X machine for in Thailand, I think we actually uh, can buy a Porsche basically. So um, it's, it's pretty expensive, but um, it's, it's been um, really great to have that um, technology called uh, Enable Machines. Um, so apart from um, establishing the, the technique um, ourselves, so we also trying our best to disseminate, uh, disseminate um, this technique to other uh, labs in Thailand. So uh, about two years ago, this is in 2018. So we um, held the first um, genomic workshop in Thailand where uh, over 150 um, scientists from all over Thailand um, came to attend. And we also have some invited speakers from the Sanger Institute um, who are the expert in, in this field to come and give a talk. So I, I just want to share with you quickly how the workshop um, looks like. So we have a full day of lectures. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention that um, everything is completely free because the main um, objective is to disseminate um, or to raise the awareness and also um, at the same time um, educate um, people about these techniques basically. So we have a full days of lectures and then uh, in addition to that, um, we also have two days hands-on um, experimental workshops where uh, we uh, train the, the attendants um, to do uh, 10X and also to do SmartSeq2. And we e even um, allow um, the participants to bring their own samples to, um, to do the 10X and SmartSeq2 in our, in our workshop. So um, this is uh, possibly a little bit laughable um, because um, it's basically just one uh, single cell profile um, of PVMC, uh, some blood sample, obviously. But that's the kind of iconic uh, figures that I always show because it's, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I'm 99% sure that that's the first um, single cell um, profile in Thailand. So that was back in uh, 2017, 18. So, so even though it's quite simple, it's just PVMC, but, but it's the first time that we um, kind of like um, showcase that we could do this in Thailand and convince other people in Thailand as well. I mean, those who were not aware of the techniques before that you can use these technologies to identify uh, different cell types and also um, to profile the transcriptomics um, patterns at the same time. So uh, this kind of like um, help people who thought that um, it's basically the same as fax machines um, to be aware that um, it's not exactly just, just the fax machines. And you can do a lot more because um, you can basically look at different genes expression at the same time so uh, with that, um, I, I like to just quickly um, go through, you know, what we have, to, basically what we have to go through, um, sort of barriers and opportunities that we um, uh, eventually make this happen, uh, which might be applicable or similar in other countries in, in Asia as well. Um, 
So in terms of funding, um, I would say like um, to establish the lab to do um, to do a single cell technologies, funding is is one of the key. Um, we were pretty lucky to be able to use the international funding from uh, the Newton Fund as a leverage and convince our institute, which is Mahidon University, to uh, co-fund and got the machines, which is pretty expensive in Thailand. And um, so I, I would say also that um, one of the, um, the, the bottlenecks of the technology of uh, doing the experiments is consumables because still um, it is quite um, expensive. And uh, we got this uh, consumable partly funded by the Newton Fund itself and also from some other funding um, agency in Thailand. Um, however, I do want to mention, um, as many other speakers mentioned before, that um, uh, especially in Asia or um, developing countries, it's quite difficult to get the funding um, to support uh, research that um, has been considered as a um, basic research. Um, and, and basically, uh, so pretty much all the funding that we allow to have um, is gearing toward um, diseases related um, rather than um, fundamental tissues, um, something that we can contribute to um, human cell at last. And in the end, uh, we also have some funding to support uh, the training program in Thailand, which is also uh, uh, made available through the Newton Fund. Um, I also, I do want to mention about um, when you want to start something that nobody else um, were doing. Uh, bureaucracy is one of the things that you might want to consider. Um, so uh, after we got the 10x machine, um, I think not so long after we got that machine, we got visited by like um, the anti-corrupting uh, monetary people from the government just because we bought um, the machines that nobody else uh, bought it before. So they probably just wanted to come to have a look that um, the machine is real, basically. And, and also the things about, you know, like um, procurements that you have to go through because you, you are basically buying things that uh, nobody else were using. But on the other hand, uh, I thought we were pretty lucky in terms of like um, having some basic equipments like uh, um, BioSavvy laboratories available um, to do this already. We have some clean um, labs. Uh, and importantly, uh, because I work on, on systems biology in plants before, so we have the access to um, high throughput um, computing facilities, which is um, pretty helpful when you need to uh, analyze big data like this. Um, so in many countries in Asia, I think, um, especially in Southeast Asia, since the, um, the communities, research community is pretty small, so we, we tend to be pretty close and um, have a quite close niche. So collaborations are pretty easy. So in our case, it's easy to just to go to the, the lab next door and ask um, to use um, certain machines like the centrifuge, for example. And, and um, I think one of the thing of, um, of being in Asia is that sometimes we can find um, niche samples or something that uh, nobody else in the world have it. Um, um, for example, something related to, um, to tropical diseases, which um, uh, I hope to touch upon um, in the next few minutes if I have time. Um, in Thailand, um, also, I think we, we're pretty blessed with the, um, the amount of public engagement that um, our colleagues has uh, paved the way. So uh, a few years ago, um, the government launched um, a program called Genomic Thailand, which aimed to um, sequence the full genome sequence of uh, about 10,000 uh, Thai individuals. So that's sort of helped um, public um, uh, perceptions um, when we want to to do a single cell and also we just recently start a national omic centers and and i think more importantly um all the the medical school the main medical schools in thailand they're on board with this even though uh, we have to spend quite a long time convincing them this is an um, interesting thing to do but in the end uh, once they are on board then we, we hope that we can uh, get the samples and get the contribution from them so um if i have about um maybe a few minutes to five minutes I'd like to share with you um, some of the preliminary um, results that we were able to generate from this. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, we, we do have uh, quite a few projects and um, running, but uh, I, I particularly chose the one that um, may be most related to the HCAs and something that we can uh, potentially contribute to the HCA directly. Um, so the first um, sample that we have been working on um, quite a bit over the past few years is a sample from dengue patients. So in this particular uh, sub-project, we looked at uh, the 
uh, PBMC. So basically the blood samples up to patients. Uh, but basically we trace um, these two patients um, at four different days uh, before and after when the, the fever subsides, because that's when the, the most important for the key patients, because that um, determines when, if you're gonna get the, the hemorrhage um, or not. So we have two series, one with uh, called dengue fever, which is uh, the, the less severe one. And the other one is more uh, severe one called uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, also, we have the one uh, in-house samples um, of the healthy um, persons that we collect uh, the sample in exactly the same ways. But also we have the publicly available um, samples from, from 10X. And incredibly, um, we, we found that the, the, the single cell profiles of the healthy sample from our own and also from the 10X are incredibly similar. Uh, and more importantly, that's very similar to the, our samples uh, the last time point that we call week follow-up. So that's basically two weeks after the fever subsides. So that's possibly when um, the patients get back to something close to normal. And, and these are the um, many um, core founding members of this project. So I just want to quickly go through um, the, the overall results. So obviously we can see um, the UMAP um, of uh, different cell types, uh, but more importantly, I would say like uh, the most interesting things um, of this work is the dynamics of the patterns that you can see um, before and after this fever subsides. So um, generally speaking, um, basically we see the expansions of T cells uh, to what um, Deforescence, which is when the, the fever subsides. And, and uh, sure enough, um, apart from the, just the, um, the, uh, the ratios of populations of uh, cell, uh, cell types, um, which is, um, varies uh, with time, we also see um, certain genes which are more prominent in, in certain time as well. So showing you here is a pattern, uh, quite unique patterns of genes that express at different time of days um, in these two patients. But more importantly, we see that um, genes involved in innate immunities um, tend to kick in earlier. And then a few days after that, then genes involved in adaptive immunities um, just start to kick in. So this is just um, prelim data from uh, so-called uh, pseudo, um, uh, pseudo bulk analysis. But sure enough, uh, we went on and analyzed uh, the same thing for each individual cell type as well. Um, which uh, hopefully we can um, send to for publications um, pretty soon. So in, in the last uh, minutes, I'd like to share with you just one more um, story about uh, some sample, which is maybe not so typical um, comparing to what's already exists in SCAs. So one of the um, uh, former PhD students of my uh, collaborators, Pon Pan, um, she is a very talented PhD student, but also a dentist. So basically she was interested in uh, to see um, the um, what's in the dental pulp, basically. So uh, she went on to collect the third molars extractions from, from extractions. This is basically um, generally known as a wisdom teeth. So basically, um, you would remove this anyway. So uh, she collects um, perfectly healthy um, tooth, which we, I think we, we can uh, deposit to uh, DCP straight away, uh, but also the one with, um, with some uh, decay or caries and the one with deeper um, decay case into the dentines um, and, and basically uh, sure enough uh, you as you expect to see you can see some uh, uh, stem cells you can see some nerve cell in it um, but uh, more importantly what we thought is interesting is that um, we also start to see some certain immune cells like B cells and uh, CD103 plus which is um, related to, um, to tissue homings and that's only present in the deep caries um, uh, it's kind of interesting because um, in that particular tooth that she was um, analyzing, the carry doesn't reach the root canal yet. However, in the, um, in the dental pulse, you can start to see some um, uh, certain immune cells already. So, so hopefully we, um, so uh, Ananya, um, who's the, the dentist and also the PhD student who leads this project, very interested in um, uh, contributing to the, the oral um, FCA network already. So with that, uh, once again, I'd like to thank um, all the team, small teams uh, for making this happen. And uh, we'd be happy to take any questions. And um, so 
uh, even though we have a, quite a small group, but uh, we always look to uh, expand our group. So if you're interested in this area and um, like to, to get in touch, please feel free. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Vardam, for sharing the story of how you set it up. It really seems like you've moved mountains to get here. And uh, some very exciting science already. Uh, I have a question for the for the dengue side. You uh, just wondering for infectious disease. You check one very important box, which is the longitudinal profiling, and that's very nice to see how you you know saw the innate immune system coming up first, and then the adaptive. And yeah, of course, as you suggested, it'll really depend. It'll vary across cell types. Uh, and it's nice to see all of this. And, and then the question is, A, what cohort size do you need? Like how many individuals do you need to longitudinally profile uh, to see some sensible signals to find something new? And then the other question is, how does this differ from other infectious diseases? Because there's a lot of, uh, actually, maybe why don't you answer the first question first on, on the cohort mm -hmm. size? Okay. Yeah. Um... Well, I, I guess um, I can comment on that, but I, I wouldn't be able to, you know, give you the exact um, details because um, uh, I, I think there might be a way to to calculate or to compute the exact numbers. But in our case, um, basically we, we we try to gather as many as possible. So in in this particular um, example that I show you, uh, it's only two. So we, we try to see whether there's a difference between uh, the H and DFS, just you know, just uh, like two cases, but. Um, with only two individuals, we, we already see, you know, a striking um, conservation between the two already. So we don't see particularly the difference between, uh, you know, two severities, but within that one, you, you can see that, um, you know, um, the, the profile of the same base um, of different patients actually group together. So I think that's a good size already. And, and as I mentioned before that um, in week follow-up, um, two weeks after, you know, the patients got um, released from, from the hospitals, they, they um, hopefully got close to normal. And those two samples actually group, already grouped with the, the healthy PVMC controls. So we thought it was pretty reliable, even with the two. But um, sure enough, yeah, in, in the following um, uh, project that we, we're doing, uh, we have more. Uh, so I think um, in the latter one, we have about like six um, individuals of different ones. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like, um, you know, say that that's, you know, completely enough. But then, um, yeah, as you can appreciate, that it's um, limitations due to with uh, with uh, sample um, acquisition and also the funding. But do do you have any any comments? Like you know, usually like what what is the acceptable in terms of um, this kind of long, longitudinal um, uh, studies? It's an excellent question, uh, and uh, okay, if it was COVID, then and early days of COVID, then I think the acceptable number mm. is one patient and you could already get a publication. <laughs> sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think you, your answer yeah. was correct. You know, you try to get as many as possible, as many mm. patients as possible. Yeah. And the more you profile, the more you learn. Uh, and, and I was curious to know if you, you're comparing your dengue results to all the published COVID data, single cell, mm -hmm. to see you know, what are the similarities, what are the differences? Um, I, yeah, I think a short answer is yes, but um, I, I would say like it's, it's early days. Um, so, so as you can see that uh, we have some dengue samples, but um, for, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm not really an immunologist or not even a virologist, but based on, on what I um, discussed with my colleagues, um, there's quite a, a bit of um, differences in terms of, you know, the class of virus between dengue and, um, okay, may, may, maybe, uh, some duty can help with this a little bit as well. But yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, we, we, um, we try to see between the severity between, you know, like um, severe and, you know, asymptomatic as well. But um, once again, you know, with the limitations, um, there's some, some things, some signal that you can see the difference between them, but uh, you cannot yet, um, we cannot yet confirm uh, statistically. Um, I think we have still have a couple more minutes. So I want to ask a question and definitely sure, yeah. start with a comment that Vardong, your yeah. talk made yeah. my heart swell. 
Uh, it was yeah, yeah. such a brilliant talk in the sense of how much you had to do to set this up. And being the first is most difficult. Definitely, we always also want to look for the second. And I know you don't have postdocs, but you're having you're working with undergrads, you're working with grad students, and that. That means you're building capacity. What you are doing is sustainable. You are training the next generation of scientists. I see you have public, like you're writing up papers on the results from Dengue, and I'm gonna come back to Dengue in a bit. Uh, but I think it's so important that you write up how you have done what you have already done, like how you have built capacity for single cell analysis in an university or a research institute who has never done that before. Uh, I, I think people will really enjoy reading it and it will motivate not only people in Thailand, but also people in Bangladesh and India who are trying, everyone is trying to break these barriers. So I think it will be a story that at least my team will be very excited to read. And then we can translate that story into different languages. Uh, there so are many much, journals yeah. Yeah. who uh, yeah. accept stories yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, the thing about dengue was like, it was exciting for me to see dengue because I haven't seen a lot of single cell work done on infectious diseases. Uh, so it was definitely very important, very exciting for me to see that. Uh, dengue is a very complex disease, right? because of the variation in viruses. We know that there are four different serotypes, there are different genotypes, and your previous exposure to one serotype can completely change the course uh, of infection. When If you have reinfection with a different serotype, now it looks like even with different genotype. So it's uh, uh, so, it's a complicated disease and severity also depends on you know, other viruses that you've seen and other serotypes that you've seen. Uh, so for sample number calculation, there are some really good epidemiological models that can be used to see if your uh, the study that you're doing is powered enough or not. So we it perhaps will be a combination of biology and epidemiological studies, and depending on how many longitudinal samples you can get. Uh, I'm going to be a little selfish over here and say that not only me, perhaps other groups will also love to collaborate with you. Uh, our team, for example, doesn't have the expertise of doing single cell analysis, but our team is really good at surveillance. We do chikungunya surveillance, dengue surveillance, typhoid surveillance, and we have biobanks of samples. We are, they're all linked to clinical data. We can set up surveillance to do longitudinal sampling. Uh, and it's easy to do. We don't need a lot of funding, sometimes none, because it's, it's going to be part of ongoing surveillance. So if there is any time you want to collaborate, it will be a pleasure. Okay. Yeah, I, I do think that, you know, um, that's the way to go. I mean, um, because you know we can share the, the facilities and knowledge. I think that's the way that we can go together. Um, if I do have one minute, um, I do I do want to comment a little bit on on, on what you just mentioned. So first of all, I like to um you know give a, a huge um credit to my collaborator Pon Pan, who's really the one who collect all the samples, you know, and, and make this possible. So basically, she's the immunologist and and she's the one who actually knows something about immunologies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, instead of me, who's just more like systems biologist. But I also, I, I like to, um, you know, maybe um, comment a little bit on the sample size. I mean, as, you know, Xiam and, and yourself mentioned. So I think in terms of um, epidemiologies, yeah, I, I completely agree that, you know, there's a way that you can, you have to have to reach certain numbers, right, in order to be sure about something, about the signals. But, but um, I do believe that, you know, single cell is kind of different as well, because, you know, you, you get a lot more from, from you know, so-called one samples. So maybe just to address uh, Shyam's questions as well. I mean, I, I, I do believe that, you know, even though we haven't reached, you know, that point that we can make, you know, one way or another, black or white, I think um, it's still more important to publish something rather than not publish at all. So, you know, we, we hope to publish well, but, you know, without claiming too much or, you know, saying something which is not, um, or to be honest about the first, you know, about the result and, and, and get it out and share it with um, everybody else, if that makes sense. It's probably not perfect, but I think it's, it's better than, and keeping it to yourself. That, that's our mentality. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And Jyoti, there's a question from Goji in the chat. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, no. Okay, yeah, Goji asks, have you seen odontoblast in the tooth of scRNA sequencing data, big data? Uh, yeah, you, you mean our data, right? Um, mm. Yeah, I think we, I didn't mention about that, um, but we, yeah, I, I actually label um, 
I don't know if we have time to go to back to that yet, but we do see uh, odontal blast. Uh, but we do, I, I don't think it's, we can see the, you know, make say for sure yet, but you know, in the, the deep carry one, we, we see even higher odontal blast than, than healthy one. And this might be something to do with, you know, that um, the, the bacteria is coming down and, you know, basically the, um, the tooth is trying to, you know, prevent itself by, you know, generating more dentine. Yeah. So, so my um, carveter who dentist would be the, the better person to answer, but that's, that's pretty much the idea. Thanks very much, Vardam, and we're out of time. Pleasure, yeah. So, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Deepa and Sehan and Vardam for a terrific session. I think this can really help a lot for our audience, anyone else in HCA Asia who want to, wants to walk down this path. And hopefully the genetic diversity session will become bigger and bigger over successive HCA Asia meetings. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.